The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to another episode of Speaking with the Senator. I'm Senator Kevin Avart. I represent District 12. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a, a topic that will be uh, facing all of us if, if you haven't heard of it, about it already. Um, and it has to do with critical race theory and how it's being introduced into our schools and how it's affecting our education system. And I know that there are a couple of bills out there, uh, Representative Keith Amon. Uh, has basically put in a bill uh, restricting the whole idea of the critical race theory. Why is this important? It's because it's going to affect you and how we look at our culture and how we look at ourselves. And so with that in mind, I, I invited a parent, a, a concerned parent, who actually, uh, his first introduction into this was uh, uh, kind of like getting um, sideswiped. He, he didn't see this coming. and. Uh, and how it was introduced to him uh, will probably uh, interest you. So with that in mind, I introduced Dan Richards. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And being a parent and uh, a concerned parent, you, uh, you, you have uh, some children in the school system. And tell us how this all transpired, how, how you became aware of this critical race theory. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me on. Um, I, I had never heard of critical race theory before uh, the beginning of this year. And uh, how I encountered it is as follows. There was a, an equity audit that was done at our school system, SAU 70, I live in Hanover, New Hampshire. And the equity audit came back very positive, right? We're, we're, we believe in diversity and inclusion and equal rights for everybody. Sure. And I actually went to Hanover High School, graduated in 1991. Um, and it was sort of commensurate with what I remembered the school being like. And so I, and it, came, it was very positive and I, and I thought that that was great. But it mentioned something in the report about whiteness and anti-racist activist training, which I, I didn't understand what that meant. So I asked the question of our school system, you know, what is this course and activist training. And they sent me back a syllabus for this course. And the course is for the students or for the parents? No, for the students, for the students. So basically, you know, trying to teach them how to become, um, I guess, anti-racist activists and something about whiteness. So again, I didn't understand it. So I made the request. Before I received the syllabus back, I got an email from our new associate principal uh, at our children's elementary school. I have a seven-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son. And the email talked only about this concept of equity. And I read, it was a, quite a long email, but it, it introduced a bunch of concepts that I didn't understand. And so I wanted to learn more information about, you know, what the intentions were for the school. So, and in the email, she referenced um, overhauling the curriculum, difficult conversations, um, transforming, social transformation within the school, all of which sound pretty extreme to me, which I, again, I didn't understand because the equity audit came back very positive. And frankly, one of the reasons we wanted to live in the Hanover community was because of the strength of the school system. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to her and asked her a bunch of questions about what does this really mean? And I couldn't get straight answers out of her. And she kept assigning me these readings, basically homework assignments for me as a parent to educate me about what her concept of equity is. And that's when I first encountered critical race theory. 
I, I had literally never heard the words before. When you say equity, not equality, it's equity. There's two different words. A very, very important difference between those two. And again, b- before that, the only phrase that I had heard equity really included in had to do with, you know, financial characters, like the, the equity you have in a house or, right. you know, so, or equitable outcomes. And so the difference between equality and equity, as she defines it in the readings that she assigned to me, we all have equality of opportunity, but that's not what was assigned in these readings. In these readings, what they are talking about is equality of outcome in trying to achieve equality of outcome, which again, I didn't really understand. And so these uh, emails went back and forth for a few weeks. And then while this was happening, I then got the syllabus for the whiteness and anti-racist activist training. And I, it, it literally, I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. It started with a quiz that said that the Declaration of Independence was the foundation for white supremacy. That is being taught in our school system. And it went on. And I, and I actually wrote down some of the things because they recorded some of the lectures for some of their, the, the folks that, uh, that were teaching this. Um, one of the quotes was, rich white people telling working class white people that their problem is other working class people who just so happen to be browner than themselves. That is the whole history of America. Let's be clear. Our ancestors from Europe were the losers of their societies. Liberty and freedom? You think we believed in that? What history book have you been reading? We didn't believe in that. That went on for one of these lectures, two hours and 23 minutes. Uh, Then there was another lecture from a woman by the name of Robin D'Angelo. And Miss D'Angelo spent well over an hour talking about how all white people, anybody with white skin, is responsible for white supremacy and that we're all fragile as a result of our complicitness in systemic racism and being racist. I I just could not believe that this was being taught in our school system. So (laughs) I then learned that there was a series of trainings that had been mandated by the district for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, I I talked about this with my wife. Paid for with Tax with our tax dollars. Yeah. Paid for with our tax dollars. And where was this training uh, taking place? On school grounds. On school grounds. Yep. Public school. Yep. Paid for by our tax dollars. Held in the school. Uh, Third party hired to come in and and produce these trainings. Did you find out where the the trainers came from? Uh, Who who paid for them to come in? Uh, Where where did they come from? It's a firm, I believe from Colorado. And they were hired to come in and actually do these trainings. I don't know whether they were in person or, you know, okay. virtual or not. Um, but what I learned was that they had started in October and that they had been recommended by a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. And again, my wife and I totally for diversity and inclusion. I mean, this is the kind of school environment that, you know, you, you hear those words and that's the kind of place you want to live. That's the kind of place that you want to have your children raised. But I lear- as I learned what was going on in these trainings, I actually asked for, well, what are, what are they teaching in these trainings? Because after reading what was in this course material, I, I was concerned. And so they sent me the trainings and I learned that one of the things that was being taught was to interrupt people and not allow them to speak. They were, they were literally training our teachers to be interrupters. Now, I've since learned that apparently that is a model that's used for anti-bullying widely. Again, I'm not an educator. I don't, you know, I'm not a teacher. I don't really know. But um, there's a model that that teaches these teachers to to interrupt. To interrupt who? That is a great question. And ultimately, it was me. So on February 25th of this year, um, so I've been an entrepreneur for the last 17 years. my wife and I, both of us, and we believe entrepreneurship is the way to, you know, for some of us to live the American dream. And we wanted to donate an entrepreneurship center to our district to teach entrepreneurial skills, you know, light that entrepreneurial fire early, you know, right. the earlier, the better. And teach a man how to fish. That's exactly right. And so we, 
we're, we, we've been working on doing it at the high school, but we wanted to extend that to the elementary school because our children are young. And we just think it would be a, you know, a great thing and a lot of fun for the kids to do. And so I, joined, I went to a PTO meeting on February 25th, the first PTO meeting I ever went to. I get to the PTO meeting and to talk about the Entrepreneurship Center and part way through the PTO meeting, the, the participants started talking about HB 544, which was a bill that I was familiar with. Now, I'm not a particularly political person. You know, I, I show up and vote, but that's about all I do. And, and for my viewers, just uh, if you're new to this type of thing, PTO stands for Parent Teacher Organization. That's correct. HB 544 is House Bill 544. So that, that's a number of a piece of legislation that's going through. I'm doing this a lot now, especially when, when we're in committee. A lot of and acronyms come out. A lot of these, these little, uh, what's an FOR or PIA or HMO or whatever. I want people to understand what that, what that you know, means. Um, and spe specifically for the millennials out there that are not engaged in politics right now. And uh, the young folk. PTO is actually where parents actually get together and they talk about issues. And so you're at a PTO meeting and I, sorry for interrupting. No worries. Go for it. Uh, yeah, so, so I went to the PTO meeting to talk about entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. not to talk about politics, not to talk about, you know, bills on the floor of the New Hampshire legislature, but it was brought up by, by one of the ladies in the PTO meeting. And um, she said she was against the bill. And then another uh, woman spoke up and said that she was against the bill. And I didn't really understand why they would be against the bill because I had read it and the bill as I understand it was a bill that would actually prohibit racism and discrimination and treat everybody equitably, which is, you know, what I think should be it's the standard the in our schools. It's the 14th Amendment. It's exactly right. The 14th Amendment means the, act, the equal application under the law. Those people that created this whole document, uh, they said that all men were created equal yeah. also put that in it's in the 14th amendment yeah. i know that came a little later on but uh that it, it's a very important amendment so that all law, laws apply equally to all the citizens there isn't a special class it doesn't apply to outcome it says equal application of the law for all citizens so that everybody has that equal opportunity so if you're an op entrepreneur and you're trying to do something uh try to build something the laws don't give you favoritism over another person, it, it's equal application. Yeah. I wish our people in Congress would, would realize that. But anyway, uh, I interrupted you again and no, I apologize. No, but uh, anyway, so- No worries. So, so I raised my hand and said, I, guys, I don't think that you understand or maybe you didn't read the whole bill, but I, I you know, had read the bill and thought that it would actually be good for our, our schools and for our state and that people would be treated more equitably as a result. And uh, I think I'm for the bill. And, and I sort of left it at that. And then a few others spoke. And then uh, somebody else said, well, Dan, why are you for the bill? Like, what are your reasons? And, I, and so I started to describe why I thought the bill was a good idea. And while I was doing that, I started to do that. A school administrator who was attending the meeting uh, raised her voice and said, I'm interrupting you. You're not allowed to talk. People like you that have uh, you know, views like you are not allowed to do what you're doing. I've been trained to interrupt you. She said those very words. Several times. And, and, and I said, what do you mean you've been trained? I mean, this is, this is a democracy. I've, I'm, a, I'm able to speak. I'm a parent. I'm concerned. You know, part of the educational process is spirited debate, in which case she shut me off again and said, you're not allowed to speak. This I'm is an administrator? You. This is a school administrator. I, 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 I was stunned. I was absolutely stunned. Um, so, you know, then I, I said, look, I'm not here to create a problem. I don't even want to talk about this. I want to talk about entrepreneurship. So I said, why don't, if we want to talk about this later, why don't, this is not the, you know, why don't we just schedule another time? Yeah. And hmm. so, so the episode ended, but I can tell you, I, I, I was, I was just shocked. And meanwhile, while this was going on, this interchange with this, with this woman, my, my wife is upstairs putting our children to bed. <laughs> she gets a text on her phone from one of our friends at the meeting asking, is Dan okay? He's being attacked. 
Oh my gosh. So my wife is putting our, our you know, our, 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 our seven-year-old daughter and our five-year-old son to, to sleep. In her mind, she's thinking, my husband's at a virtual PTO meeting. How can he possibly, why, why wouldn't he be okay, right? Why is he being attacked? Like, where is he? So call in the Navy SEALs. That, I mean, it, <laughs> it's a PTO I, you know, meeting. I just, right. so she comes rushing downstairs after getting that text. And at that point, the, the meeting is concluding. I said, what happened? And I said, you're not going to believe this, but I just got basically canceled at a PTO meeting because I had a different opinion and then tried to describe why I had that opinion and wasn't allowed to do so. Um, That's scary. Yeah. Yeah. That's sc- because these are the educators. These are the ed- people hmm. like this individual are supposed to be role models. They're supposed to be teaching our kids not behaving the way that they behaved. So since then, I've done some additional uh, work to try to understand what is going on at our school system and what is going on with this DEI committee, such that it is. So there was a a DEI committee meeting uh, just a little over a week ago, a week ago Thursday, that I, I logged into. Now, the only way that I found out about it was because a, a member of the superintendent's staff let us know. The DEI committee has not been publishing when they're meeting. They haven't been, as far as I know, keeping minutes. They have been meeting basically in private, not keeping the public informed. And when I joined the meeting, which was a virtual meeting, uh, there were half a dozen people there, including a school board member. They said, oh, hi, what are you doing here? And I said, Oh hi, my name is Dan Richards, and I'm he, I just I'm a I'm a parent, and I want to know what's going on with the DEI committee. Could you give me an update? And I don't, you know, I'll just listen. I'm not interested in disrupting the meeting in any way. They said, "Well, it's really not a public meeting," and, and I said, "But there's a quorum here." <laughs> I, I, and I, yeah, and I said, "Oh, okay. Well, can you tell me what the governance structure is of the equity committee?" And the school board member immediately chimed in and said, well, we don't really have one. We're kind of trying to figure that out. And I, you know, and I thought to myself, wait a second, this committee has been meeting for at least a year and a half now. They report to nobody. They meet in private. There is zero oversight and governance. And they're putting forward trainings that are harming people in the community, people like me who just want to know what's going on and are trying to speak and are having their speech suppressed. And so I, I didn't push it. I said, okay, well, have a nice meeting. And uh, I, you know, I got off the line. But I filed a complaint with our district. I asked them to disclose all of the information with respect to the DEI committee, what they're doing, all their you know, meeting minutes, and, and all their governance materials. And I asked them to pa- press pause on the trainings until somebody could provide proper oversight. Because I learned actually, subsequent to this interaction, that nobody's reviewing the trainings prior to their deployment in the community. Literally, this firm has been hired. Nobody has provided the right approvals or governance as part of this process. And nobody is reviewing what they're doing. Does this fall under the auspices of, uh, or the the Frank Edelblut, the commissioner, does he know about this stuff? So I, I filed a formal complaint, not only with our district, uh, but also uh, with Commissioner Elder Blue's mm-hmm. office, and uh, both uh, committed to open an investigation. Um, since that has happened, or since I, since I reported, I haven't heard back as to what the, you know, the progress of the investigation or if, if there is one uh, that is being done. You definitely need to follow up on that. I asked the district um, to halt the trainings. I asked them to reprimand <clears throat> the individual involved. I asked for an, ap- an apology and for them to condemn her behavior because that's not okay. And as of now, I, I don't know that any of those things. Uh, what do your have neighbors think about this? Have, have they, uh, have you talked to any of them about this? <laughs> uh, what's going on with that? So nothing good. So immediately following the PTO meeting, uh, some friends of ours, just a few days later, reported that uh, a friend of theirs, who I don't believe was even at the PTO meeting, heard from someone that 
that I'm a white supremacist and that I'm a racist. So because I went to a meeting and asked a question and then was not allowed to finish, I am all of a sudden am a, I mean, I was there to talk about entrepreneurship and I would have loved to have been supportive of their diversity and inclusion initiatives. And yet all of a sudden I'm the enemy. This does not, it just didn't make any sense to me. And, and we're hearing this more and more now about me and my family and, um, you know, our lives have been turned upside down and it's really unfair. I just started watching a, a series on Netflix. <clears throat> it's called Secret uh, City. And uh, okay. uh, it's just, it, it's how things seem to, to get get done and how you can shame somebody and, and, and uh, discredit them just by uh, putting out false narratives about somebody. And that's what's really, really scary about all of this. And uh, all these false narratives, and you know, I'm, I'm seeing leg legislation right now. We had a little conversation before the show, but it seems as though whether it's in uh, environmental services or judiciary or education, there's there's these uh, attempts for data collection, and it's bothering me. Mm -hmm. Why do you need data collection uh, on the beach, or when you're going to our state parks up at the Flume? Why do you need, and we, we did kill that bill. It was, well, that part of the bill was SB 114 FN in the original language where uh, these teenagers uh, that are working for uh, fishing game or, or the lifeguards or people just in that particular area, uh, they have to engage in almost police activity and put in a database uh, of, of de-escalate uh, racial things that are going on rather than watch the water and making sure that nobody's drowning or, or rescue somebody that, that's injured on a trail or, or something to that effect. And then they put all this data somewhere. Nobody describes where it's going. Uh, another one the other day in judiciary, uh, they wanted to keep on judges and, and, and just a whole host of people. And I'm thinking, what's going on with our society? Why do we need We're all this? Americans. We're, we're Americans. <laughs> we're the melting pot, right? And, and so... We're, we're keeping data on, on people uh, and, and, and turning people into snitches and, and getting people to, well, he said this and she said that and wasn't politically correct. And I think I mentioned this the other day that I was watching this uh, movie again, uh, probably the third time in the last five years. It was called 1984. And there's a, a, a really um, important scene where one, this gentleman who seems to be some kind of a reporter or something to that effect, he goes into the cafeteria. Everything's gray. <laughs> you know, equal outcome, right? right? Equal outcome. And he's sitting at the table and uh, a gentleman goes over to him and says, good thing about the, uh, the, the, the destruction of words. Beautiful thing, isn't it? And another guy pipes in, doubly good, doubly good. And I'm thinking, wow, yeah. destruction of words. And then, of course, he's writing in a little book and he's putting it in the wall just so the cameras don't see him. And I'm thinking, are we living in 1984 real time? How did these guys know this is something that we're going to be dealing with in 2021? But it seems to me as though if, if you say something, uh, you, you're going to be labeled. I mean, I didn't even get to say anything. Right. <laughs> right. And you were all, bullied. I, you can't all, do it all, in school, but you can do it when all, you're out of all school. All I tried to do was, was get some more information and ask a question and present the fact that I had a different point of view without being able to even describe what that point of view is. You know, you know look... I grew up in New Hampshire. My high school, I played football in, in high school and in college. We had guys on our team that were all different races. They were our, you know, we'd go to war on Saturdays with them. They were brothers. I mean, we, we looked out for each other. Don't you, don't you find it incredible that you have to explain that? I, you don't have to explain. It's just, I just, it's. I grew up in the 70s and the songs back then were the ink is black. The page is white. Together we learn to read and write. Yeah. And uh, we were healing. It seems as though somebody's pulling the scab and setting up they're this person trying. and this person and that person. And they're, they're, they're trying to make us pay for the sins of our fathers, which, if you believe the Bible, is immoral. You can't do that. You're, 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 and somebody's, somebody's whispering in somebody's ear. Somebody's whispering in somebody's ear. 
and they're causing us to be divided. And you're a perfect example of that. I, I interrupted you. No, no, I mean, that, that, that's fine. My, you know, look, before I met my wife, I had two serious girlfriends. Not that you want to hear about my, you know, my dating history. Two serious girls. One, one was black, the other was Chinese. I never even thought about the fact that they weren't white. It didn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me. And it shouldn't matter to anybody. I agree. And I think that that's the thing that, that really is troubling is the fact that you actually even have to say that, especially nowadays. Uh, we're, we are all Americans. We've gone through warts and all. You know, our history is, is, is laden with all types of, of, of bad choices. You can go to every Irish, you know, Italians, blacks, the Asians, the railroad tracks, you know, wait, wait, the, the mining. Uh, we have a, a, a really sordid history. Yes, bad things happened. We had genocide. Bad things happened. We had uh, immunizations down south where, you know, they in injected bad things. For into, sure. In, into, we have a bad history. But one thing that is beautiful about our Constitution, it, it, it sets a, a goal. It marks a, a line of delineation where everybody is to be treated equally, that our civil rights are to be protected. And if you demonize the very Constitution that protects those civil rights, then we're going to have tyranny. And T totally. if, if you destroy the monuments, there's a... Sorry, I, I keep bringing can, up the Bible. Can I share something about CRT? And yeah. I think it's important to get sure. this on the record. This is CRT's playbook. CRT is designed to divide us, to put us into groups of oppressors and oppressed, and to get people to dislike, be jealous of, or hate each other. That is what CRT is designed to do. What we should be doing is coming together as Americans. Right. We are all brothers and sisters in this, this great country of ours to solve the problems that exist, identify those problems. Yep. Critical race theory doesn't do that. It only seeks to make things worse. We can solve these problems. We have been solving these problems for the better part of the last half century. Just given the opportunity to come together, I'm confident that we can. But people like me who have some ideas about how we can fix some of what's going on out there have to be allowed to speak. Because CRT, as soon as you say that you have a different opinion or a different approach, you're silenced. And that's wrong. That's very wrong. And, and it is the destruction of our country. I was going to mention something about the uh, the monuments and how that they're being they're being torn down because they were racist. Well, you know, are, do we knock down Caesars? You know, how far back do we go? And there there's a biblical passage that says, if the foundations be destroyed, where will the righteous go? You have to have these things. It doesn't mean you're celebrating racism. It means look where we've come from. That's where we were. Here's where we're at. But if you get rid of where we were, we're going to repeat it. Yeah. And we're going to be at each other's throat. And I have a feeling that the people that are pushing this dividing, are, are it's a power play. And I, I do believe that, um, like we said about the, the, the sultan there, that throwing those little cannonballs at, at that foundation that was protecting Constantinople, those yeah. cannonballs in the same spot over and over again broke down that wall. The wall for our freedom that protects our freedom is the Constitution. And the men and that were part, that put that together, they weren't racist. They were not racist. They set the stage for a free America. Look at all the other countries. Tell me one country in this entire world that there's a classless society. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. Senator. Is there any other final thoughts that you have? Only that the people, I think many of them who are out there that are watching this are either encountering CRT for the first time or they're encountering it and they don't even know it, right? It comes cloaked in this seductive language of, of equity and diversity and inclusion, which are good words, right? We all, we all want that and it, and it draws you in. And before you know it, it's, it's planting these seeds. So I think they're well-intentioned. I think they need to be educated. They need to understand where this train goes. And it's a dark, dark place. And it's something that we need to stop and we need to stop it now if we're going to do the things that we all in our hearts, I know, really want for this country. 
Thank you for coming on the show and, and discussing this. And uh, sometimes it's not easy to, to talk about uh, subjects that are that uh, you know ruffle the feathers. But if you have an issue that you want to come on the show and talk about, you're very welcome to. I really think that we need to uh, get a handle on this and get it soon before it starts uh, setting children against each other and against their parents. Uh, that's that's another show for another time. Until then, thanks for watching Speaking with the Senator, and we'll see you next week. Seating program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.